Trigger warning, this podcast episode contains discussions of emotional and narcissistic abuse. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Emotional Abuse is Real. I'm your host, Serene Leeds, and I'm so glad you're here. Before we get into today's episode, I wanted to draw your attention to a news story that's been on my mind for a while. Back in September, Rolling Stone magazine co-founder Jan Wenner gave an interview to the New York Times while promoting his latest book, The Masters. When Wenner was asked why the book only featured male rock stars like John Lennon, Bob Dylan, Mick Jagger, and Bono, he told the Times reporter, quote, none of them, meaning women, were as articulate enough on this intellectual level, unquote. On the same note, when pressed about the book's lack of black artists, Wenner said they, quote, just didn't articulate at that level, unquote. The backlash was swift and loud, and soon afterward, Wenner was removed from the board of directors of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, an organization he co-founded. As for Rolling Stone, Wenner had left the magazine back in 2019 after selling it to Penske Media Group. Needless to say, if you're a regular listener to this podcast and know my own emotional abuse story, then it shouldn't surprise you that I was jumping for joy at this news. This is mainly because I have long held the belief that Jan's outdated behavior enabled my own boss, aka my emotional abuser, to not only do what he did to me, but to get away with it for as long as he did. Also, because none of Jan's tone-deaf comments in the New York Times shocked me in the slightest. I was just ecstatic he was finally being held accountable for them. Shortly after Jan's ouster from the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, I connected with a journalist named Marissa Cabas, who was writing an article about the female experience under the Jan Wenner regime at Rolling Stone. I'm thrilled to announce that she published the article a couple of weeks ago and that I had the honor of contributing my story along with a number of other brave women who shared very, very familiar experiences to mine. I hope you'll take the time to read Marissa's article, which I've linked in the show notes. Shifting gears, here's my weekly reminder that emotional abuse is real still needs your support, and there are several ways you can do that. First of all, if you're a listener and you'd like to share your story, please don't hesitate to reach out via Instagram at Serene Leads Rights. That's S A R E N E L E E D S W R I T E S. Reach out via our Emotional Abuses Real Facebook page or reach out via email at hello at sereneleadsrights.com. A reminder that anonymous guests are always welcome. Another way you can support Emotional Abuse is Real is by heading over to Apple Podcasts and both leaving a rating and writing a review. The more reviews we get, the easier it is for people to find this podcast. Finally, you can support the podcast by following me on Instagram at Serene Leads Rights and following our Facebook page, Emotional Abuse is Real. And if you are able, please consider donating to our Buy Me a Coffee page, which I've linked in the show notes. As I've said before, this is a one-woman operation, and your donations help fund the podcast's production costs. I'd also like to remind you about my free newsletter. This is a great opportunity to stay up to date on my latest published articles, as well as new podcast episodes. Also, it's a wonderful way to stay in touch with me directly, especially if you are a business or brand owner looking to punch up your website, email, or social media copy. I am available to work with you on any writing or editing you may need with your business and brand copy. Plus, as an added bonus, I send out a free delicious dessert recipe to every new subscriber. I've left the sign-up link in the show notes, and you can also subscribe directly via my website, sereneleadsrights.com. 
My guest for today's episode is Dr. Jamika Woody Cooper. Dr. Cooper is a clinical and criminal psychologist based in the St. Louis area, and I'm so happy she joined me on the podcast to offer her insights and advice for emotional abuse survivors seeking support. So without further ado, here's my conversation with Dr. Jamika Woody Cooper. My name is Dr. Jamika Woody Cooper, and I am a clinical and criminal psychologist. Excellent. Welcome. Lots to talk about on that topic. So uh, we're here talking about emotional and narcissistic abuse. Uh, so much of this of the content on this podcast is of survivors sharing their stories, which of course is is vital. Uh, but since therapy is critical to the healing process. I just want to let you know that I'm thrilled that you're here to offer a clinician's perspective. So what, what are you seeing in your practice when it comes to victims of emotional and narcissistic abuse? Specifically, uh, what are some of the most conspicuous examples of symptoms that you're working with someone who has been emotionally abused? Wow, that's a really good question. Thank you. I see, okay, I guess uh, if I had to put it into two categories, I see people who have consistently been in like toxic, uh, dysfunctional relationships, Yeah. whether that's friendships or romantic relationships. And then I have people like in one category that have maybe legitimately been with narcissistic individuals. And then I have a category of people who feel like they've been with narcissistic individuals. And that category is probably much larger. I'm sure that's true because I mean, we... I- we talk about that so much on this podcast, the word narcissism is thrown around so much when it comes to emotional abuse. And it's like, it needs to be, but at the same time, we have to know exactly what we're talking about, because I know that that is a clinical diagnosis. And in a lot of cases, that's not always the case. So is there any way that, you know, non mental health professionals can wade their way through, you know, figuring out who is a narcissist and who just might be exhibiting narcissistic tendencies? It it would probably be quite difficult to do so because it is certain criteria, things you have to look for that have to be present in a certain length of time. But most people can display symptoms of narcissistic personality. It's just that personality disorders in general, and uh, of course, narcissistic personality disorder is rare. It's just not as common as people think it is. So just because you see a certain constellation of symptoms or behaviors with one person doesn't mean that they exist with, with all people. It doesn't mean they exist in all situations, in all circumstances, at all times of the day, at all times of the year. Um, so it just, it depends on so many factors, but yeah. I know from my professional experience that when people have been in a relationship with a person who display any of those tendencies in their minds, they just swear like this person is definitely narcissistic and yeah. they, they act like this all the time. Yeah. I mean, cause I find that I started this podcast and I was just focusing on emotional abuse, even though my abuser my therapist definitely called him a narcissist. But I mean, do you find that maybe the word narcissism is used too much when trying to describe emotional abuse? Or is it like a little too intertwined? Because I feel like I'm just going back and forth and back and forth. I think most times, I would say in the past few years, mm. definitely narcissism is used too much. And narcissistic personality disorder is also used too much. Mm-hmm. Because usually when a person encounters whether in a a day-to-day environment or relationship, if they see someone who is selfish and doesn't recognize like the needs of other people, they tag that as being narcissistic. Yeah. And is it, 
Yes, but does it mean they have a, a, a mental illness or a personality disorder? Not always. Yeah. Yeah. So it's important to be mindful of that. Okay. Thank you. So when, when an emotional abuse survivor comes to therapy, what is it that they need the most? Gosh, I think they can need a lot of different things. It really kind of depends on what their experience has been like yeah. up until the time they get in therapy with me. Mm-hmm. And by, say, by saying with me, I mean, it depends on if they've had therapy before, if they've been sure. in therapy with another provider and what that experience was like. Yeah. Like if it was, if it was a good experience, they might need one thing. If it was a bad experience, they're going to need a whole different set of things. Um, but for individuals who this might be their very first time speaking about it or sharing it, that individual is going to need um, some time, some, yeah. some patience, yeah. um, some support. Um, and they, they want to be seen and heard if they've never shared it before. And they have to know like what them sharing that information means about them, what it means about their life. Lots of other things. Um, but if it's their first time sharing experience, it's going to be probably pretty intense for them. Yeah. Um, so I could need time to talk about all of the different pieces of that experience. And, and that could take weeks, sessions, months. Um, in particular, if it takes the person a while to warm up. I know the expectation with people is you come in with a therapist, if it's a new therapist, your role is to spill everything. Mm-hmm. And yes and no, like we, we do need to know why you're here and, and yeah. the particulars of that, but we don't expect it to happen all on the first session. We don't expect it to happen even over two sessions because yeah. we understand that people are different based on their demeanors and personalities. For some people you can open up easily and say a lot in the first session and, and have thought about it or journaled about it enough to have a lot of clarity about it. But for other people, it takes them a while to even warm up, to even share this piece or that piece. So time, like really time and patience is one of the biggest things I I would think a survivor needs. Yeah, definitely. Um, And I'm glad you brought that up because a lot of my questions for you are because I know a lot of my listeners that they'll reach out to me and they'll say, I I know something is wrong, but I'm not ready to do something yet, or they haven't gotten any professional therapy. So in a lot of these episodes, I'm trying to offer them helpful first steps. So is there anything in particular that a survivor should look for in a potential therapist? That's also a good question. I would think this is probably going to be, I don't want to sound convoluted, but um, what I think is the most important thing that a survivor should look for in a therapist is, and I don't, I don't want it to sound cliche either, um, someone where you have a good connection with yeah. and someone where there is a good fit. Okay. And fit could mean lots of different things as a person listen and engage with you in the way that makes you feel seen and heard. Um, or as a person, sometimes people want someone that's just sitting there nodding mm-hmm. and they don't mm-hmm. want them to really say much back. It kind of depends on what your idea of listening is. Some people want to be solely listened to. Yeah. And then some people want to be listened to and attended to and, <laughs> and helped and offer suggest- suggestions or, or questions about it. So it, it, a lot of those things kind of depend on what it is that you want, what you need as a survivor, um, what you haven't gotten in the past, what's going to be helpful for you in your healing, what's going to be helpful for you long term. Um, in other words, what type of person can you really gel with and see yourself meeting with weekly for the next year, two years or whatever? Um, comfort. Do you feel comfortable with that person? Do you feel like they genuinely care? That I I love that perspective because it allows the survivor to finally put themselves first. You know, think about what they need, what they want. And it's so funny because like for me personally, when it came to my therapist, it took a long time until I even knew what I wanted. I would go to like so many different therapists and I and I 
and it wasn't until like I under understood myself better yep. that I was able that I was able to find the therapist that worked. And maybe for me. the bad experiences helped you really kind of solidify that. No doubt, no doubt whatsoever, no doubt whatsoever. Um, yeah, because you mentioned earlier about um, things that you've been seeing in recent years. Do you find that there's been a rise in emotional abuse in recent years, or is it more that more people are willing to talk about it and are coming forward? I don't know if there's been a rise in emotional abuse, but I do know that there's definitely been an ar- an, a rise in awareness of emotional yes. abuse and what that is. Okay. I think for a lot of, a lot of times in earlier generations, um, it, it just didn't talk about it. Right. Like some things were just pretty normal. It was part of being in a relationship, part of being married, part of blah, blah, blah. Yeah. People just accepted certain things. But I think now with knowledge, more knowledge of mental health and, and factors about healthy relationships, people are more aware of what they should have in relationships. Yeah, that's one of the many reasons why I started this podcast, because my abuse happened in the workplace nine years ago. And back then... um. I had no support because everyone was just telling me to get over it and deal with it. Yeah. So, yeah. And it's amazing when you think about previous generations and what they endured in the workplace, what they endured in healthcare, what they endured in relationships and normalize it all. It's, it's so true. Cause in the beginning I felt I didn't have the kind of support that I needed from my parents because only because of the generational factor um, it wasn't that they didn't support me or that they didn't love me. It was just, they're just like, well, you know, just learn to deal with difficult people. And it's like, well, no, <laughs> I'm not going to do that. Not there are def- yeah. definitely things in life that you do have to learn how to deal with. Sure, sure, uh, abuse sure. Abuse is not one of them. Correct. Absolutely. Um, because I find that so many... Uh, like I find, I find a lot of people in toxic relationships, they stay in these relationships you know, a lot longer than likely they should. And, you know, it's so easy for people on the outside to be like, why are you staying? Why are you staying? Why is it so hard for some people to recognize that their relationship is toxic? So many questions, but... I think people find it difficult to recognize that their relationship is toxic because of what their background and experiences are. Yeah. If the majority of your background and experiences are that of toxic relationships, starting with your family and maybe that being dysfunctional family dynamics, maybe you've been sexually abused, physically abused, or you've seen that in your home, then your kind of baseline, your foundation of what normal behavior is is skewed from the very beginning. So depending on where your background experiences are, that's one factor in it. Your experience is another factor is your, your level of self-esteem. Yeah. How you feel about yourself, what you think about yourself as compared to, you know, people around you in the world. And then of course your resilience, your level of resilience, that kind of really determines a lot about what you see as normal and how you're able to bounce back from that. So, for some people, I mean, depending on what cultural background you come from, yeah. there's there's a stigma yeah. about abuse and toxic yeah. relationships. And it just, it exists, but no one talks about it. So it's going to make it very difficult to talk about mm-hmm. it, depending on what culture you might be from. Um, I, I know, and I know that that's true. What, I mean, what advice would you give to help break those stigmas? My advice would be to, if you're finding it difficult to even acknowledge that this is abuse, definitely find a professional to talk to. Find someone that you can share your experiences with and, of course, someone you trust. Because maybe then that person can help you gauge like what your experiences are and how to categorize it and what you need to do about it. Even if that person that you are sharing it with is not the person that you also choose to help you with it, but just find someone that you can really 
trust to share that experience with. That can be a friend or family member. Yeah, to start with one person. Yeah. So what, on the, on the, on the flip side about toxic relationships, if you've been, you know, if, you know, depending on your family upbringing or your experience with possibly other, possibly other toxic relationships, what should people look for when entering a relationship to, to ensure that they're in a healthy situation? That's a, that's a <laughs> good question, but I think there are lots of answers. What should people look for in a healthy relationship? Yeah. And this is it's going to sound a little different. I yeah. would say look for a person or a situation where you feel like you can be yourself, you can be accepted, you can be comfortable, and you can trust the other person. But I think people have different levels of what that looks like. Because yeah. I think I, I see all the time in my profession that you people can be in a dysfunctional relationship, but they can be comfortable in it. Mm-hmm. And they can feel like the person accepts them. And they can feel like the, they can trust the person when none of that is really true. Yeah. Yeah. So it, it's hard to say what you should look like, because I think sometimes for survivors. Yeah. The, the definition of those variables can be different. Sure. Sure. I get that. Yeah. No problem. Okay. But I would say in general, we oh, should yes. always have to be in relationships where you're not being harmed or hurt. Yes, of course. As a baseline. Yes, of course. course. Because there are all these other pie in the sky things that I I mean, acceptance, trust, um, emotional needs being met, uh, meeting your love languages, um, someone that values you. But how do you know if you're being valued? Right. There's so many different things. But I think at a baseline, we should all start to be in relationships where you are not being emotionally, physically or psychologically harmed. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so, and what is your advice for family and friends of emotional abuse victims? Like, how can they best help their loved ones who are going through it? Family and friends can help loved ones if they know that they're going through emotional right. abuse. Yeah. By acting as a, a listening ear for one, being available, yeah. being able to listen if um, the individual needs to share their experiences. Um, providing a, a safe place, uh, a sound place, a stable, a secure place. And by safe, I mean without judgment. And that's really hard for a lot of people to do because yeah. if you're in an abusive relationship, those outside can clearly see what's going on and have they can feel a way about it. They can have a, a value judgment about it. Like, I don't like it. It's bad. It's wrong. All true. But yeah. for someone in that situation, it's not helpful right. to, to hear the judgment or you should do this or the blame. That's not helpful. That's not a safe place. Yeah, You can offer suggestions on getting help without mm-hmm. judging. Yeah. The avoid the you should uh, sentence. Yeah. Yeah. Or I'm, the uh, why would you or why right. are you? Why aren't you? Because I observe that a lot. So I'm glad you brought that up. Thank you. And just uh, the other uh, piece of advice, it goes back to what, what I was saying about, I, you know, I know that I have listeners who aren't quite ready to reach out for help, but, you know, they know that there's a problem and they listen to this podcast. What advice would you give to these people for, say, like a, like a good first step? A good first step is just try to find a good therapist in your area. If it's not a religious person that you Mm -hmm. feel that you can trust, if it's not a family member, a good first step is to find a counselor or a therapist in your area. Okay. Uh, Maybe it's your primary care physician because you don't feel comfortable seeing anyone else. Mm -hmm. But find a professional that you do trust that you can share your feelings with and just see what it feels like to share your feelings and then go from there. But chances are it's going to feel really, really good. Yeah. <laughs> and you're going to see the benefit of it. And it'll, uh, the sharing experience will kind of sell itself. And on that note, why is it so important to talk about emotional abuse? It's important because 
people need to be able to share their their stories for one yeah. as a healing um, aspect, but also we need to spread the word that emotional abuse exists. Yes, we need to let people know what it looks like, what it sounds like, what it feels like, so that individuals in these experiences can can start to recognize when they're they're in these these situations and hopefully that they will want to get out of those. Absolutely. That's, that's why you're doing the work you're doing. That's why I have this podcast and absolutely. Um, so how can people best connect with you? Social media, website, floor is yours. <laughs> yes. Well, it's like social media. You can find me on TikTok, uh, mm-hmm. that doc, um, Jamaica. Okay. My TikTok on um, Instagram, it's Dr. Underscore Jamika, which is J-A-M-E-C-A. Okay. Um, YouTube, Dr. Jamika. LinkedIn, Dr. Jamika Woody Cooper. Uh, okay. My website is drjamika.com. Okay. Um, any of those places, come find me there. I can point you in the right direction. Any of Wonderful. Those. Awesome. Yeah. And I'll leave links to all of those below, but I wanted to give you the opportunity to say which, which ones, you know, were your preferred. <laughs> yeah. Wonderful. Awesome. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure talking to you today. Thank you for having me. Oh, it was my pleasure. Thank you for listening to my conversation with Dr. Jamika Woody Cooper on Emotional Abuse is Real. If you would like to connect with Dr. Cooper, I've left links to her website and social media accounts in the show notes. If you would like to share your own emotional abuse story here on the podcast, please don't hesitate to reach out at hello at sereneleadsrights.com, via our Facebook page, Emotional Abuse is Real, or through Instagram at Serene Leads Rights. Please note that this podcast should not be used as a substitute for professional mental health services. If you are a victim of emotional abuse and need help, please call or text the Suicide and Crisis Hotline at 988 or call the National Domestic Violence Hotline at 1-800-799-7233. You can also text START, S-T-A-R-T, to 88788. Once again, don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review the podcast on Apple Podcasts. Follow me on Instagram and Facebook. Sign up for my free newsletter, and if you can, please support us through our Buy Me a Coffee page. Thanks so much for listening, and I'll see you next